Well, good evening, everyone, and hello, and hello, and welcome to September. Oh, my gosh. Who would have thought that it would already be September, you know? And have we got an amazing 20th show coming up for you to kick off September? Oh, just wait. We've got so many great stories coming up. I do want to welcome you all. Thank you all so much for being here as we are celebrating our 20th show. Now, we started doing all of this, obviously, 20 weeks ago. And it really came out of the fact that I do a variety of tours, lectures, and things like that. And through all of this, that got canceled. And so I was really missing out on that time chatting with people, sharing stories, hearing stories. And so I thought, well, you know, what is the best way to make that happen? And so came up with this whole idea as a way to keep that going, that conversation and that learning. And so that's really the whole goal of this is that we all walk away knowing more than we did when we came in. And that is the case tonight. I mean, I've been learning the stuff all week about stuff I've been researching. So we're going to have a great show. Now, this is made possible by folks like you um, doing donations. However small, everything is welcomed, whatever you can afford. Um, you'll find my Venmo at the very top. Um, let me know if you're for a different method. We also do have sponsorship from AARP right here in Arizona. And they like to say that the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. ARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. And if you'd like more information, you can go to their website, which is right there, that arp.org slash AZ. And, you know, they've got a variety of online programming as well as this. Um, I know they have a drum circle which is a lot of fun. And it's all based on just getting people to be active and creative. So they don't care if it's a pot and a pan and a spoon. You are more than welcome to become with whatever you can make noise with pretty much. That's all it requires. So take a look at some of their programming and as well as some of the other information to just help you get along better with all that's going on right now. Also, I will ask if you're watching on Facebook, if you could do me a favor and just click share. So that way, all your friends will know the fun that we're having and get a chance to learn about Arizona across the entire state. Thank you so much. Now, as we talk, you know, there is always the chat over here where if you see that screen, you are, you are more than welcome to chat questions, comments, things like that right there. And you can also, after the show, if you want to reach out, you can also track me down on Facebook, which is Marshall Shore, Hip Historian, or Instagram, Hip Historian, or even email which is hello at hiphistorian.com. As I know, we've had viewers in the past send me photos saying, hey, you know, what is this? And sometimes I've been able to answer their questions. Sometimes there's not much more we can know about some of the things. But also I'm happy to announce that I have a brand new website that is hiphistorian.com. And that will be, um, you can sign up for my newsletter there. And Julie, yes, this will indeed. So all 20 episodes are actually archived on YouTube. So if you Google Hip Historian, those will come up on YouTube and you can watch those as well as some other programming that I've been doing since we've all hit this COVID moment. And as we all just kind of learn to figure out how do we progress and stay connected. 
Oh my gosh, we have someone coming in from all the way from Wisconsin. Well, thank you so much, Patricia, for joining us. So in this episode, we have our special guest. We also will get a chance to talk about Little Arizona. And this time, this time we are talking about Pinedale, a little town that you might not have heard of, but has a quite unique or at least a couple things that I think are really kind of fascinating. And then we'll talk about some Arizona music as well. We are going to be talking about JD's. We'll also be doing trivia and our special guest has created the trivia. So that way we will all get a chance to share in some of the stories as well as we'll be talking about something from my collection because I have a house full of things. And this one's really special and kind of near and dear to my heart. So we'll go through that in a little bit. But I just kind of wanted to give you an idea, just whet your appetite for the fun that we are going to be having. Now, my name is Marshall Shore. I'm also known as the Hip Historian. Now, you might wonder, how does one get a name like the Hip Historian? Well, you know, about 20, a little over 20 years ago, I was working in Brooklyn at a library. It was an old Carnegie building, kind of like what we have in downtown Phoenix. And you can see a little bit, but this photo is more the reason why I left New York. I was sick and tired of the snow. It was beautiful for about a day until the slush hit. And then it really turned kind of gray. And I was ready to get out of the cold, ready for a new experience. And loaded up everything we own into a U-Haul. Now, luckily, the U-Haul that we had was a little bit larger than this because that's quite a small thing. I don't think I could have fit a lot of what I owned into that little van. And so got to Arizona and promptly moved into a 1956 ranch. That was actually really one of the perks of moving to Arizona was at that time we could actually find. And so we were looking for a mid fifties ranch that was original as possible. And I think we did really good. I mean, well, when we got, it was beige on beige. There were lots of beige tones. I think there were shutters. The house was like three different shades of beige. It was kind of a beige nightmare if that's even a thing, but I'm happy to say the inside is pristine. I mean, there's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, even the push buttons inset in the wall for that matching stovetop. And then if you look at my oven, wait a minute, oh, there, wait a minute. There we go. If you look at the oven, you'll notice that there is a little bit difference probably between the oven that you might have in your modern house. If you look really close, you'll notice that there's no window in that oven. So when you're trying to bake something, say a cake, and you want to check on it, you've got to so carefully open that door, but even more gingerly shutting that door, because if you let it slam, your cake will fall and nobody wants that. Now, as soon as I got here from New York, all I kept hearing about how, how there was no history and you know, I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, I came face to face with so many amazing stories that a decade ago, I actually walked away from libraries to kind of pursue this whole historian passion full time. And so that's why I, I love hearing people's stories and connecting with them. And then you have that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we know and love all those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on their way to somewhere else, and they were moving to Arizona, and in some cases looking for a house just like mine. And then, you know, on days like today, you might wish you could be soaking in a canal just like these folks. But, you know, in walks Dr. Carrier, who had an invention, and it was called air conditioning. And so Dr. Carrier brought air conditioning out West and it changed our lives. Now we can sit at home 
in your lovely formal gowns in front of your air conditioner in the middle of summer and stay comfortable. Why, you can even serve jello. And with your AC, your jello will not get mushy and dissolve and become a bowl of sugar water. So thank you, Dr. Carrier. So that way we can all enjoy that jello treat throughout the entire summer because of you. Also, the Phoenix New Times has named me best historian several years in a row, as well as Phoenix Magazine named me the best bespectacled Phoenix celebrity because I do indeed like my eyewear. Now, in case you're wondering, what is Marshall wearing? You know, because I've kind of developed my own. I Oh, I didn't even realize I was wearing the same shirt. So I have definitely developed my own sense of style. And so, and you know, because everything for me is really honestly about the story. And so I am wearing a suit coat that actually was created for me back in 2012 during Centennial. Now, you know, because every, every February 14th, we have a great celebration for ourselves here in Arizona, 100 years of statehood. And so back in 2012, we had stuff going across the state and someone gave me 15 minutes on the main stage in front of the Capitol on February 14th to talk about anything I wanted to. And I talked about one of my most favorite events that I never experienced. Most people have not, but it was such, I think, shows Arizona in such a moment. And it was originally started back in 1926 by this woman, who is Charlotte Hall, who was a poet, a historian, a preservationist. And actually, if you ever make your way to Prescott, you can go visit her house, which is now a museum. It was also home to territorial governors. And I love the fact that you can go commune with things that Charlotte Hall touched and had in her life. Now, the event was called Mask of the Yellow Moon. It ran from 1926 to 1955. At its height, it had about 5,000 high school and college students performing. Now, it was first held here at the Elsie Shriners Temple, which is still standing. It then became the Mining and Min Mines and Mineral Museum. But it's just on the street from the Capitol. And in 2012, they got kind of kicked out for something that didn't happen, but I am happy to say they will so well soon be moving back into this building after it's brought back up to code, which will take a few years, but that little quirky museum will be opening its doors soon. So it moved to M Montgomery Stadium, which was over on 8th Street and Polk. And it was home to a variety of things, including our very first bowl game, which was called the Salad Bowl. And what would you expect from the Salad Bowl? Why none other than lots of people coming out to see the game, as well as a parade that included Queen of the Salad Bowl riding in her very own salad bowl with even a spoon and fork to serve that salad with. That would be one heck of a salad, but those people in that audience sure do look hungry. Now, the Mask of Yellow Moon was a, based on a legend about how the God of Sun would give his rays to make the earth golden and warm and make things grow. It was, so it was always a springtime festival. Now, it was pretty much a rite of passage. I actually, to get ready for Centennial, did a focus group with about 12 women who had been in the, the mask of the yellow moon. And they talked about what a rite of passage it was. That moment where they felt so much larger than just themselves, but part of the community. They actually, in 1956, when they stopped it, they actually had complaints from student body about why they didn't get a mask of yellow moon. Now, it was woven through the curriculum of, of pretty much every high school in town. And all the clubs got involved. So you had, here you have the debate club. They would do skits. You had multiple marching bands, including really large sets. And here you have lots of young women who would take to the stage and dance. 
Now, they weren't just dressed in whatever they could find. They actually had costumes designed by students, made by Homek. And so all those women had all those costumes, and I was lucky enough to find a few dresses in a box. I mean, this one was just stunning. I mean, this whole like Art Deco Aztec, pretty phenomenal and an amazing shape. And I was able to convince three friends to join me on stage so we could talk about the outfits as well as the Mask of the Yellow Moon. Now, you might be able to guess that I'm not a very good wallflower, so I needed something that would stand up to those dresses. And so I had an idea. And I talked to my friend Glenn, and I and Glenn was is a sign designer who rolled into, into Arizona in the early 50s. And he designed all kinds of signs including one we're going to talk about in just a little bit, which was JD's down on the river bottom. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And so Glenn painted a suit coat that was an homage to the Arizona state flag. And I think he did a great job. In fact, it actually got me going. I have a variety of suit coats. And... That means I can basically show up to almost any event overdressed, but always on theme. Now, one of the reasons why I always start off with this story is because I like to say you never know where the next part of a story is coming from. And I was doing a program for First Families of Arizona. Now, everyone to be a member of that group has to be able to prove their family heritage prior to statehood. So it's a fascinating group to talk to. So many stories. And when I was done talking, this woman, Norma, came up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, come out to my car. I've got something I want to show you. And she pulled this dress out. Now, this was her dress that the, her mother wore in the Mask of Yellow Moon. And it was late 20s, either 28 or 29. She had programs. But, you know, I didn't feel like I could touch those and degrade them any further with my greasy little grubby hands. So I look forward to taking a chance to getting a look at that dress all covered in butterflies and seeing exactly what number that dress was worn for. So hopefully Norma will give me another chance to do that. And also, First Flames of Arizona is a proud sponsor of Arizona History Happy Hour. If you would like to find out more information about them, you can go to their Facebook page, which is First Families of Arizona, or you can also track them down online. Um, they do have a web, web page, which is the acronym www.tffoa.org. So the First Families of Arizona. And you can have more information about some of their programs virtual coming up. Now, you know, it is Arizona History Happy Hour, so we always have a cocktail. And I'm happy to say that this one is brought to you today. Um, we've got a great collaboration going with the Valley Ho. And so they created Hair of the Dodge. So playing up on our guest, and let's see. So basically, there are the ingredients. I'm going to take you over here to my little bar. So that way, I was able to go pick up a cocktail to go, which they packaged in this cute little jar. I mean, if you take a look, they've even got labels for it, so they know exactly what you're having. And so it makes it super easy to enjoy a very special cocktail. And that's all it takes, which is kind of exciting. Now I'm gonna do a little bit of my own addition. I'm gonna add a Luxardo cherry because I bought these for another cocktail. And because it's got some cherry liqueur in it, I was like, you know, why not splurge? And do just that. So cheers. Oh, 
Oh, oh, he outdid himself on that one. That is so tasty. All right. All right, so before we go any further, I do want to show just a little bit of something from my collection. And so this is a truck and trailer that belonged to Bill Johnson. Now, Bill Johnson had a restaurant over on Van Buren, Bill Johnson's Big Apple. And so this was actually was given to me by his granddaughter. As far as we know, it's actually the only photo that we've ever been able to find of the truck and trailer he had a portable radio station. So he would take this around and be able to use it as a office as well as let's see if I can get. So yeah, so he would, so he would travel with this as well as it was a portable radio station. So he could do dance parties, just like what he would do at the restaurant. And in case you're wondering, let's pop that. And so there's what Bill Johnson's look like back. Um, the sign and the restaurant actually date back from 1956. Um, sadly, the sign nor the building stand there any longer. But it was definitely a part of Arizona culture. And so, again, thank you all so much for being here. Now, through the miracle of modern technology, not quite sure how modern that is. I mean, it does have a dial on it, but it does have a video component. Oh, my gosh. We have a special, special guest. And um, let's see if we can get this to work. Oh, my. Oh, my gosh. Look, there are two people there. He decided to stay. <laughs> and welcome, Tony. I'm so glad you said to stick around. <laughs> hi hi everybody <laughs> so so cindy and tony where are you guys we are in northeastern arizona off of i-40 on famous route 66 at the jackrabbit trading post mm -hmm. and we're still hopping <laughs> <laughs> indeed you are <clears throat> so we're gonna have some fun let's see bump We'll do that. Bump. So we always do trivia. And so it's a moment where you can take a chance to learn. What we'll do is we'll go through our questions. And then we'll take a little bit of an Arizona music history break and then come back and talk about those answers. Because, you know, for me, it's not necessarily about what you know or what you don't know, but that when you leave the Arizona History Happy Hour, you will know more about Jackrabbit Trading Post than you did when you started the evening. And who knew? You'll be able to talk about a historic trading post that's still around. So what you can do is, oh, so before we start there, so if you want to, you can keep track of things either in the chat. You can also have a pen and paper. I know some of you, depending on how you're watching, may not have access to the chat, but that's why you can take a pen and paper and just kind of keep track of your score on your own. Now, we're not going to grade you or anything. We all <laughs> trust you to be truthful with your answers and not change them just so you can get a great score because it's all about fun and we are going to have some good fun. All right. So our first question. What famous highway does the Jackrabbit Trading Post sit just north of? Is it A, I-10, B, Route 66, C, I-40, or D, I-17? Which one of those does the Jackrabbit Trading Post sit north of? So while you're doing that, I'm going to have a sip of my cocktail. <laughs> All right, on to question two. The Jackrabbit had signs for drivers coming in from the east and west that listed what? A, mile marker numbers. B, minutes to the Jackrabbit. C, miles to get to the Jackrabbit. Or D, none of the above. What did those signs along that iconic highway, what did they list? 
It's one of those three. Well, actually, it might not be one of those things because we have D, none of the above. So the beauty of this is, if you don't know the answer, you can take a stab at it and get a pretty good chance of getting it right. All right, on to question three. What year did Route 66 open? Was it A, 1926, B, 1946, C, 1966, or D, 1976? Oh, there's a lot of sixes in that. I just, <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah, so what year ending in six did <laughs> Route 66 open? All right, and question three, I'm sorry, question four. The town of Joseph City is just east of the Jackrabbit. What kind of power plant is located there? A, solar, B, coal, C, nuclear, or D, wind? What kind of power plant is Joseph City known for? And you can see it for miles before you get there. All right, and we're at now at the halfway, that midpoint of our trivia. Hope you're all keeping up with us. All right. What is the rainy season from June to September called here in Arizona? A, summer. B, monsoon. C, hot. D, windy. What do we like to call our rainy season right here in Arizona? that we're kind of in, but <laughs> we're kind of lacking the rain part. But yeah, <laughs> non soon, non soon. Oh, yeah. Right, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so question six, the jackrabbit opened up in 1949. What was it before the trading post? A, used as a Santa Fe building, B, the Arizona Hepatorium. C. I the, oh, did I spell it wrong? I don't know. I think it's, I might spell it wrong. It's Herpetorium. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, C. <laughs> the Lucky Me Cafe and Dance Hall. Or is it all of the above? What was the Jackrabbit Trading Post before it was that back in the late 40s? It's one of those three or maybe all of them. Jim Taylor is the original owner of the Jackrabbit. What was the family name of the three other owners? A. Robinson, B. Rabbit, C. Blancet, or D. Zimmerman? So we know the first owner was Jim Taylor, but it's been in the same family since then. And what was that family name? All right, and question eight. What mid-60s interstate bypassed the Jackrabbit and a lot of other places? A, I-10, B, I-17, C, I-40, or D, none of the above? What 60s interstate bypassed a lot of different places, including the Jackrabbit. All right, and we're coming into the home stretch. What tributary of Arizona runs along the BSNF line just, no just to the south of the Jackrabbit? A, the Colorado River, B, Manila Wash, C, Arizona River, or D, the Little Colorado River? What body of water runs along the train tracks just south of the, of the Jackrabbit? And question 10, what abandoned trading post sits at the end of Joseph City? A, Frontier Trading Post, B, Apache Fort, C, Geronimo, or D, Ella's Frontier. So one of those is a name of an abandoned trading post just at the end of Joseph City. 
And we actually have a bonus question. And our bonus question mm -hmm. is, the second owner of the Jackrabbit in the 50s and 60s, Glenn Blassett, was A, an Arizona state representative, B, Arizona state governor, C, Arizona state senator, or none of the above. All right. So while you're all kind of getting your thoughts together, making those last minute decisions, we're going to talk a little bit about Arizona music. <laughs> and so today I kind of gave you a little preview of what we're going to talk about. In fact, it is JD's. Now that nightclub, which was in, on Scottsdale Road, just south of Curry, on the Salt River riverbed. <laughs> which normally, as we all know, is dry, but that's not always the case. It was a, decker, a double decker club and it featured live country music on the main floor and rock and roll or rhythm and blues in the basement. Now it had a capacity of about 3000 people. And so it really was one of those iconic clubs in the mid sixties. Now it opened up in 1964 and the JD stood for James David. Um, the original owner was Jim Munsell, and it was his first and middle name, those initials. And now one of the things I love is, so here is the sign as well, and it became kind of the home of Maverick Outlaw Country and West. It was really coming of age at that moment. Now, Jim's son also brought in folks. He made a, a deal with Waylon Jennings, who is the house band for quite some time. But you could also come in and hear folks like Johnny Cash or Willie Nelson playing on any given night, as well as Mike Candelo, which might be a name you recognize from Waltz and Ladmo. He did a lot of music with them as well. Now, interestingly enough, the guy that painted my suit coat also designed this sign as well for JDs. And it actually won a, a sign competition and, by General Electric and as one of the best signs in the country. Now, I should say it was on River Bottom and it was mostly dry. But back in 65, it did get flooded. And over time, it became a variety of clubs until now it is a store. So there we go. All right. So who is ready for some answers? Hope you all <laughs> get your thoughts down. I, mean, I, 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 I you, you two look so eager. Oh my God. That's great. Like, okay, okay. <laughs> so very good. All right. So what famous highway does the Jackrabbit trading post sit north of? Route 66, get your it, kicks. <laughs> yeah, no, indeed. And so the Jackrabbit had signs for those folks heading east and west to the Jackrabbit. And what was listed on those signs? Those were the miles to get from where you saw the sign to get to the Jackrabbit. That's how far it was going to be. And we always heard people, we have people come in the store and say they were kids. They would watch those signs and they would ask their parents, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And then finally, that's where the big here it is sign comes in. Face both ways that you're, either way you come, you see the here it is. <laughs> and you knew you were there, you had arrived. <laughs> now, how do you keep that tradition of those mileage signs up today? I, I started making them a couple of years ago. We had, uh, had a friend out of Vegas and at the... That asked me a while back and after to make some signs. And uh, I, when her dad and that there we had an accident and that there at that, at that time and that there, I had forgotten all about the sign. And uh, when uh, he, he had actually passed away and that there, her son was working on a on a page for us on Facebook. And uh, when I got back, I was looking through the paperwork. We found the uh, um, what I was for an order for the sign and that there. So I decided to make the sign and send it to, to the gentleman in Vegas. He went all over Vegas and that there showing a sign in that there and my wife one day i was painting more signs went out to the outside and i had signs plastered everywhere took a picture and they took off uh, to this day got we're excited. probably up almost the 300 <laughs> of the big signs in that there you know we, we decided to just continue the tradition of the signs being out there you'll see them along the road now 
another part cool. another part of that history is um jim taylor the original owner mm -hmm. they didn't know what what could we get people's interest how are we going to get them here and make them excited to be here well they worked with a store out mm -hmm. of winslow which is another part of a historic part is the men for only store it was a lady with a cowboy hat sitting sitting down and um it was a men's store, a, a clothing store, and they went together up and down the road, putting for men's signs only and the jackrabbit signs in the miles to get there. So we kind of, they kind of worked together, and that's part of a Winslow little tidbit too. So, so how would people get a mileage sign if they wanted to have their very own mileage sign? Just give us a call at the jackrabbit or or so, whatever. Just come in, stop in, and say, "Hey, I'm going to order one." And the hand so, Tony hand makes the big ones, you know, and so they take a couple of weeks to get done. We have, we have the small ones too. We have little mini ones that we can do right now in the store as they're waiting. Oh, very cool. That's, yeah. cool. That's so cool. I love that you're keeping that history alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a big part of our history. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Because there used to be all these signs all down the highway saying, oh, oh yeah. you're almost yeah. there. You're almost there. <laughs> all right. we, we had a, so what yeah. year did Route 66 open? 1926. Mm -hmm. Now it wasn't always the same road. It's like through time there were different alignments. Yeah. Yeah. And so what? So what year did the alignment open up for the Jackrabbit? I don't know when it actually opened up through here. Um, I, I had to have been early on, uh, but we got bypassed in like '67. But I don't think we were the Jackrabbit. I don't think the Jackrabbit was here. At I mean the the building was here when 66 went through here, but the jackrabbit came later, I believe. Ah, uh, okay. And I think, I think we have a question coming up just about that exact thing. Oh, and so, okay. So this, so I, I, you know, I'm always curious about what's going on with this. So Joseph city has a power plant. Yeah. And it is indeed be a coal mm -hmm. power plant. So as you're driving up to the city, you can see the smoke coming up out of those smoke stacks long mm -hmm. before get there now what is going on with it because i've been reading that it was supposed to close and we keep hearing it's going to close we're not sure when um i actually had a guy come in the store the other day that he was part of a dismantle group but i don't know when that's going to take place he didn't know when it was going to take place but they keep saying it's going to happen so i don't know what's it they're going to take it apart and take it away i guess i don't know and don't know yet. nothing's going to be there so maybe possibly in the next couple of years nothing will be there Wow. That's going to be such a change for the whole city. Yeah, yeah it will, it will be. be. Quite a bit. Yeah. The area around here, it will be. Yeah. All right. And what is, well, I mean, I wish it was the rainy season that I we know. have right now. <laughs> I mean, this is an easy question, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but you know, but I, I know we have folks that are tuning in from not Arizona. So yeah, that's, you true. Know, that's the thing. So, <laughs> so it was monsoon or as you put it, a non soon we've been getting so non rain storms. Yeah, yeah. I know we've been getting some dust storms, but dust does not yeah. make things oh, grow. Yeah. All right. Question six. So you were talking about how the jackrabbit opened up in 49, but mm -hmm. what was it before it was the jackrabbit? Well, it used to be an old Santa Fe building. I'm not sure if it was like a, they used it for, we've heard that school children went here, but there's an old schoolhouse just, just, um, just east of us off of 66, but just east of us. And um, they said this was an old BNSF building. Um, I'm not sure what it was used for, but then it, in the early 40s, for a few years, maybe it was the Arizona Herpetorium, which is a rattlesnake pit. And oh, uh, yeah. yeah, and yeah. then when then when 66 was coming in a, a day before we got bypassed, um, there was a place out on the other side of Holbrook that got bypassed. Well, they decided their business got shut off completely. The Rockwells they came and we're going to try and make a, a a go of this place, and they tried it for a cafe, a diner like a, a hamburger shack and a dance hall for the year before in 1948 and it didn't make it. And then that's when the Jackrabbit became the Jackrabbit. 
So it was oh all of the above. Yeah. Wow. And it was called the Lucky Me Cafe because I'm like, what, what, a, what yeah. a great name. I was like, yeah, lucky. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, it was a good name. But yeah. it did. Maybe not so lucky for them. So, well, obviously not so lucky for them. Yeah. But yeah. yeah I can only imagine all those hungry travelers. Yeah. Now, driving yeah. along Route 66. Well, when, when, we, when they tore down some outbuildings before my dad added on to the, the apartment, he added on because he had four kids, they added the house on. And in the walls of some of these outbuildings, they found plates and silverware and old coins and boas, like feathers from boas. So you just oh you know, not use your imagination, you know, what it could have been. So I, I love that it was also the <laughs> boa yeah. feather in yeah. the wall as well. Yeah. So it was so quite there, there was plates, there was forks, and we know it was some kind of a restaurant somewhere at some point, <laughs> but we don't know <laughs> if that was way before still or if that was the year before. We don't know. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right. And so what is the family name that still runs the Jackrabbit? That would be us, the Blancets. Um, Jim, Jim Taylor owned the building. He leased it for the first couple, few years he had it. 1961, my grandfather, Glenn Blancet, came in and leased it in 61 and bought it in 67. My parents, Pat and Phil Blancet, 1969 till 1980 or 1995 when Tony and I um, took it over. And so I'm obviously the Blancet part. We're now Hawkus now though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But still that family name is there. I love this yeah. account for three generations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, and before so, and since we're showing the here it is sign, I will show off an an artifact <laughs> that you told me of what I got at the Jackrabbit last time I was there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a pair of men's underwear. Yeah. That it tell you here it is. Now I'm gonna tell you about those are those are that's probably a collector's item now because we can't get those anymore because <laughs> nobody makes white undies anymore. No. Oh my gosh, I never even thought you of can't that. Find I you mean, can't. they make underwear, but they don't make white. They make plaid, they make, I don't know, solid colors, but they don't make white. You can't get white anymore. <laughs> That's yep. so funny. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh. All right. And what mid 60s interstate bypassed the Jackrabbit? And that would be I 40, right? Indeed. Just to the north of us, yeah. Yep, it changed. A, good thing and a bad thing is 66 was a windy road and all the way through Arizona. Sometimes it's on the south side, sometimes it's on the north side, and 66 straight through went right through it. So it's it's, it's not, not Route 66 is not going to be passable all the way through anywhere through here. Yep. It's off and on, off and on, or not drivable at all, not there at all. Right. I mean, that's one of the things I I kind of like. I mean, the fact that a Arizona has the most usable parts. Right. Of 66, but yeah. also as you're driving along I-40, you'll look over and see what looks almost like a wagon trail. Yeah. And that exactly. is indeed old Route 66 now taken back over by the earth. And yeah. and Arizona has the longest stretch still drivable from Seligman to Kingman of all of 66. It's, stretch past the Seligman. it's where they have their annual, except for this year, they have their annual fun run the first of first part of May every every year, usually, except for this year. <laughs> uh, indeed, lots of things have been canceled this year. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Big hit. All right. Question nine. What tributary of Arizona runs along the BSNF line just to the south of the Jackrabbit? And that would be the Little Colorado River. The Little Colorado River. And there, Manila Wash was in that answer. It, it just is just to the east of us. And it can fill up pretty fast, too. But it runs really nowhere. But it does get full and it does fill over. But the Little Colorado River mm -hmm. runs right through us. And we can usually not get a rain. And we can watch it fill up from when it rains in New Mexico. And we can just stand there and watch it come as it fills up. And all of a sudden, boom, it's full. Wow. Yeah, it can get pretty full and running pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome to watch. It's truly awesome to watch. Yeah, no, I've got some friends that um, were just up in Antelope Canyon. Yeah. And I know there's stories about how it's like if it's even a, th a thought of thunderstorms, they don't let you go in for that reason. Yeah. Because you don't want to be down in there. Mm -mm. Yeah, you don't want to be down there when that water comes rushing through because. Oh, no. <laughs> yep. They yep. always say wherever you are, if you can see lightning and thunder far away, get out. If you're in, if you're in a swimming hole, if you're in a like up and pacing or some get out of there, get yeah. get away and get to because you know that where there's it's gonna it's gotta go somewhere. 
and you don't want to be there. No, (laughs) not at all. All right. And question 10, what abandoned training post sits at the end of Joseph city? Ella's frontier. She was just, just West at the West end of Joseph city. I mean, there the couple of answers. There was a Apache Ford at the other end. It's it burned down years ago. And then Geronimo of course is on down the road, but Ella's frontier has been there a while. And, and we actually have that sign in storage and it's going to be going to a new home, maybe somewhere somebody will want it and um, be in a good spot soon. So, well, depending on, I mean, if you already have a home for it, there's also down in Tucson is the Ignite Sign Museum. Mm-hmm. And they have been collecting signs from across Arizona and putting wow. them on display. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if you don't have a home for it, I'm sure they would be interested. And actually, um, they're a guest coming up in October, kind of talking yeah. about some of the signs they have and some of the stories about how they acquired them. Yeah, that would be cool to see. Yeah, I mean, and they've, they've been, they've, I know, rescued some neon that was destined for a landfill mm-hmm. or, actually, yes. or actually scrap. Yeah, that's, that's good. Out. Yeah. That's and good. They take them down there, refurbish them, bring them back to life, relight them. Mm-hmm. So they're all this amazing neon that they've got down there. Right. That's nice. Good. Good deal. So, yeah. So, I mean, I love how Arizona has become kind of this hotbed of neon preservation. Mm-hmm. I mean, got like Kingman doing a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, even Casa Grande and Tucson have been doing a lot yeah. to preserve that neon history. Nice. And we, we want it to bring back is it's, it's a, it's a, it's part of our history around Arizona for sure. Right. I mean, cause really Arizona kind of came into its own as the car was rising up. And so you suddenly mm-hmm. had to have signs that would highlight your business and trying to mm-hmm. outshine your neighbors. So you had to have a right. sign bigger, <laughs> bolder, brighter than your neighbor. Right. Yeah. So. All right. And then we have one last question, which I was so happy you included this because I had no idea. So, mm-hmm. all right. So the second owner of the Jackrabbit, Glenn Blancett, was? In the 1950s and 60s, he was an Arizona state senator. And at that time, he owned, he had built in the early 40s. Um, they had lived in Joseph City with my my dad and my uncle, my grandmother and him. And, and they built the... Pacific Motel and Restaurant in Joseph City and decided to get out of that. And when he was in the Senate, they decided to sell. And he finally said, enough of the, the, the government. He goes, I can't stand the lying, the cheating, the backstabbing. So he got out of it, sold that over there and came over here and took this. <laughs> and at that- So that also being said, he knew he could see the bypass coming. He yeah. knew it was coming. Because he had been here from 61 till he bought it in 67. He could see it coming. He knew he had ties that he was able to talk to somebody to be able to get us an exit off. Because if it wasn't for that exit off, we probably would just be another ghost town. Yeah. Um, yeah one, of the lucky, one of the lucky ones there. Yeah. yeah. Some people like that. Some people didn't like that. But it's the way it is. And we're still here. And we're so happy we are. Well, and I love how, I mean, really, Arizona has really been at the forefront of preservation. Yeah, mm-hmm. 66. Yeah, and yeah. So you guys have been a part of that as well. I mean, I mean, every time I'm just, I'm always amazed by the number of international tourists. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we may, we may not even see that for a couple more years. So yeah, I, actually, I know we actually have a guest coming on October as well, kind of talking about that. And so a yeah. lot of international tourists aren't coming <laughs> here until like 2022, and yeah. so we figure and, out. And, and we're hoping that's true because. In nineteen or in twenty twenty six, it's the hundred year anniversary of Route sixty six. So there's going to be lots going on. Yeah. And, oh, and, and they're going to want to come. My gosh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's not too far off in the distant future. It is not. Wow! Yeah. How, how exciting! I didn't even realize yeah. hundred anniversary of the start of Route sixty six. So how are you guys doing up there in kind of this moment? I mean, as I know we've talked a little bit of how I know your numbers are down. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. but well, you know, we're, we're hanging in there. It's definitely not what our normal is by any means. And nobody, not many people are traveling. They're too scared to travel, which we understand. But if you think about it, now is the perfect time to get out there. It's it, Everybody's taking precautions. They're safe. The motels are safe. The restaurants are taking extra precautions. I mean, it couldn't be any safer right now than it was before. It, it, they, they're more so. And, and people need not be scared because it, the crowds aren't there. I mean, it's perfect time. It's, and it's get out there and support all of us. We, we definitely need it. 
Exactly. So yeah, so that's why I really want you guys on. And I love, okay, so hardly anybody ever gets very good scores on the quizzes, but here we have Anita and Carol Lee saying, Whoa, I got a perfect score. I got 11 out of 11. So, <laughs> good so deal. Really cool. well. Nice. So, Thank you. <laughs> and then my friend Mary was um, so. Um, there were a group of Italians that they've befriended that actually were here for Route 66, kind of yeah. as part of the whole international tourism thing. Okay. Oh, cool. Nice. So, yeah. So, again, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, well, hope you. Some of the folks will come up and see you. Yeah, come thank on you. up. We're Appreciate here. It. We're ready. And, and, get a, and get a mileage sign. Yeah, get a, yep. get a, even if it's just a little one, we'll get your picture outside with the rabbit. He's 35 years old this year. This one is, he's number three. I, I guess I should extend that as a question, but there was oh, three rabbits here. Was this one's rabbits. number three. Yeah, and, and, and then we'll put you on Facebook and make you famous. I know. I love that it's like you do that. It's like you put people out in front of the rabbit and take a photo yeah. of oh, the yeah. rabbit sign. So. Oh, yeah, heck yeah. Her dad, her dad used to do that all the time. Yep. Oh, I didn't realize that. So, yeah, I mean, I love the fact you guys keep that history alive. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and it's I had a big, no big 66 thing to do. It really is. I mean, because we are 71 years old on Route 66 and not many can say that. Exactly. Yeah. So but thank you guys for being on and getting a chance to mm -hmm. share your story about the Jackrabbit Trading Post. Well, thank you. Thank you. So. All right. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Uh, you too. Good night, Bye -bye. everybody. I'm leaving. So, you know, let's give them a big round of applause because that was so much fun. Oh, my gosh. You know, and I love knowing that it's like there was some politics going on even at the Jackrabbit in a time where, indeed, there was lots of corruption going on right here in Arizona. So now we're going to take a little chance to talk about Little Arizona. So this really kind of evolved out of, I was supposed to be working on a book that I think now may be kind of defunct, not quite sure what's going on with it. But it really was a chance for me to look at those towns and explore those towns that really are less than like trying to stick around a thousand people. Because, you know, even though we are the home of the fifth largest city in the country, we have so many little towns that provide such a unique flavor to Arizona that you can't get otherwise. And it was really a chance to explore those towns. And that's been the fun for me is really those learning moments. Because we're going to talk about a little town called Pinedale. Now, Pinedale is in Navajo County, not that far from Sholo and has a population of around 490 people, just a little under that. Now it's part of the Mogollon Rim mountain range. And here you have the historic school, originally opened up as the school for the area in 1939. It is now a community center that is run by a local nonprofit. Right next door is the library. And Pinedale was first known as Mortensen after Niels Mortensen, who established a Mormon settlement there in 1879. So oh, as we see there, 1879, it was also known as Percheron for a breed of stallions, which Mortensen brought with him. But by 1888, the settlement was called Pinedale. Now, as I was researching, of course, because it is that old, it does have a historic cemetery. But what I found even more fascinating was that it's home to a covered bridge, which is not, I mean, being from Indiana, which is famous for its covered bridges. I mean, you can get calendars with covered bridges, covered bridge of the month type thing. And so this covered bridge is unique in Arizona because it is the only one that is still used for the public. There is a road that runs right through it that you have to drive through. And as I was researching, what was kind of fun was finding out that it was actually built in 1976. And 76 is an important year 
because it was our bicentennial. Now, Moretta Thompson was a part of a, I mean, basically from there and was the first one to really kind of pitch that they do a covered bridge. And at first the community was not into it, but then Moretta passed away. And, and to honor her, the family gave half the money to be able to fund the bridge. And so the city had to come up with the other half and they then built a covered bridge and it was dedicated on July 4th of 76 for Bicentennial. Now there was a huge rainstorm that rushed through and actually damaged the bridge. So in 78, it was rebuilt. So it's kind of interesting that we have a mid seventies covered bridge right here in Arizona. And I was shocked to find out that there are a dozen covered bridges around Arizona, but this is the only one that the public still uses, which I found really fascinating. I didn't realize there were any covered bridges in Arizona. So remember, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, I know some of you have sent comments and Anita, yes, I still need to get back to you because yes. <laughs> um, as we're looking to book, I mean, I've got now until December 31st, the end of December to book. Um, I'm doing good. I've got most of October full. I am actually have a meeting next week with the state fair to see if they want to do a special state fair edition since that's been canceled. Kind of letting people know about the history of the fairgrounds and the fair itself, starting even back in territorial days. So if you have any suggestions, comments, or even ideas for folks you think would be great guests and have good stories to tell through trivia, please reach out. Here's how you can reach out. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, email, and even through my website, you can reach out to me, send me an email through that way. So there are lots of ways to connect. And also through the website, I'm actually probably not tonight, but in the next few days, going to have a merchandise link up so you can buy some postcards of some of those iconic signs around the valley um, that were all touched by Glenn Guyette and his hands. So next week, I am happy to say that we'll have Frank Barrios who wrote a book about Hispanics in Phoenix. And so he's gonna have a wide variety of questions. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. Frank is really great. So if you haven't picked up his book or heard him speak, he is so much fun. And Sarah, I'm glad you brought up ghost tours for this year because indeed, so you know, normally for October, I have buses full of folks driving around talking about stuff. That's not going to happen this year. So I'm actually working. Um, hopefully by next week, we should have dates for small tours of 10 people or less because I got one of those microphones that I can wear under a mask with a speaker because that was initially my concern was how do people hear me if I'm wearing a mask? I'd have to really yell. And so at least with that speaker, it's a little bit easier to understand. So, and instead of a bus, we'll actually be doing a walking tour. Um, we've also been talking about doing some sort of a virtual piece as well. So looking forward to kind of, kind of flushing that out. There may be several different things coming down the pipeline. So just kind of playing with some ideas. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So um, there also should be a newsletter coming out next week. If you go to my website, which is hiphistorian.com. You can sign up for the newsletter there and that should go out next week. And there will be dates for walking tours um, as well as there will be an option to book your own private tour for your own group. So there'll be options as well. And again, trying to keep it responsible so that way we can all hear, but also stay safe. So again, thank you all so much for being here as we get a chance to talk about Arizona history and to share some unique stories. Now this happens because of some of those folks out there that have been able to make a small donation. Anything is appreciated. 
as well as we do have sponsorship from AARP. Now, they do say that the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. ARP is here in Arizona, providing information that can help you and your family. Their website is aarp.org slash az. So you can find out about different programs they have, different services. So please check them out. They have a nice variety of things going on that can benefit a wide variety of folks. So I'm looking so forward to next week. Um, also on September 19th, we are doing a panel. So right now I have Barbara Seville and Davina Ross. We are gonna be doing a drag history of the Valley, talking about some of the old bars and some of the old performers that would be around there, some of which are not around any longer. So there'll be lots of good stories. You can find that on Facebook as well as some other sources. So if you just keep track of the Facebook, Marshall Shore Hip Historian, you'll find links to that as well. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. So I also would like to say a huge thank you to Cole Travis and Chris Allen for that amazing intro video. You know, they, they didn't even work together. It just kind of fell to pl in place and they did such an amazing job. As well as PJ Vader Baron, who is with the Cafe Zuzu at the Hotel Valley Ho as our cocktail advisor and keeps knocking it out of the park. I mean, this is so similar to a Negroni, which is one of my favorite cocktails. So thank you, PJ. And I love the fact that you can get a cocktail there or get it to go and take it home and enjoy. Now we do have outro music as well as found video that is from Mr. Ho, who has who is currently based on the East Coast doing orchestratica, kind of a lounge music coming, but he grew up right here in the valley in Sunny Slope. So remember next week we'll be here and we will have Frank Barrios as well as we'll be talking about little a little little Arizona. We'll have some music history as well. So expect lots of fun and thank you all so much for being here. Have a great rest of your night. And I'm going to send you away with our outro, which is Mr. Ho and then filmed film footage from the fifties right here of folks in Arizona on vacation. Thank you all so much for being here and have a great rest of your night.